Chapter 13 The Paleoponnesian War lasted for 27 years, which would be considered a long time nowadays. Rest assured, it was a long time in ancient Greece, too. One might wonder why the Athenians and the Spartans didn't sit down over a nice cup of tea and work out their differences, but they did not. Instead, they fought long and hard over questions like which of them had the most naval strength and the superior form of government. There was a six-year peace in the middle, rather like an intermission of a play. But then the fighting started up all over again. It must have been very tedious for all and all concerned. Wars, it cannot be said too often, are a dreadful business. And this one was no different. But just as optimism has its dark side, the Peloponnesian War was not without its bright spots, at least in terms of literature. It prompted the Athenian general named Euclides to write a gripping work of history called The History of the Peloponnesian War, and, as Alexander observed to Baron Hoover, a clever playwright named Aristophanes to write comic plays that made fun of the generals, including, one supposes, Euclides. Now, unless one has been told by one's governess to write an essay on the subject, the causes and consequences of a war that has been over for thousands of years is unlikely to be a topic of dinner com table conversation. Yet, Euclides' history and Aristophanes' plays are still enjoyed to this day, which proves that when it comes to liking a good story, people have not changed very much at all. However, the incorrigible's governess had told them to write about the causes and consequences of the Peloponnesian War, so it was all quite fresh in their minds. After lunch, they debated the relevant, I relevant issues with gusto. Navy, trade, helots. Helots were what Spartans called their slaves. Democracy versus oligarchy, Alexander pronounced with confidence. Plague a woo, his sister observed for it was an outbreak of plague that finally did the Athenians in and forced them to surrender to the Spartans. To make her point clear, Cassiopeia mimed dying a gruesome death from plague. It was marvelously convincing. If done in public, it would no doubt assure anyone of getting a seat on even the most crowded bus. Plague Awu is correct, Penelope mumbled distractedly, for she was busy thumbing through a stack of books, searching for some clue as to how to rescue Simon. Where were prisoners kept in the vast, unfeeling city? And how did one secure their escape? And fuller understanding of the workings of the legal system was what she really needed. But without access to a law library, she had only the stack of novels she'd brought from Ashton Place as reference. Within these books, she found tales of bloody revolutions and innocent men falsely accused, all of which seemed to end with nooses and guillotines. As plots went, they were thrilling. But the thought of Simon in such a predicament filled Penelope with dread. Dear me, a rollicking story is a marvelous thing, but these are far more exciting than one would ever wish real life to be, she told herself. I had best put my books away and consult Miss Clark about the matter. She seems to have a personal experience of bailing someone out of prison. I hope it won't stir up painful memories if I ask her advice. Plague -o Cassiopeia howled mournfully as she pretended to choke and gasp on the floor. At this inconvenient moment, Lady Constance burst into the nursery. Miss Lumley, what an extraordinary adventure I've had, she announced. So extraordinary that I simply must tell someone about it, even if it's only you, and even if I had to walk up several flights of stairs to do it. She paused for dramatic effect. Miss Lumley, I believe I have had an epiphany. An epiphany, in case you have yet to have one, is when someone encounters truths about life which wish with which they were previously unfamiliar, thus sparking an abrupt change of perspective. If the change is unpleasant, it is called a rude awakening. If the change is enlightening, it is called having an epiphany. Neither experience is medically dangerous, though the person in question may find themselves mulling things over for a good while afterwards. I said an epiphany, Lady Constance repeated, now sounding a bit cross. Don't you want to know about what? Of course, my lady. Her mistress's arrival was unexpected, to say the least, and Penelope found herself flustered and wishing she had put away her recent laundry stockings, which were hung to dry by the window. Also, Cassiopeia was still rolling on the ground, twitching and foaming at the mouth quite brilliantly. "'I am having an epiphany about the poor,' Lady Constance proclaimed, stepping daintily over the writhing child. "'Believe it or not, I have spent the day among paupers. 
A pauper is someone who is exceptionally poor, she added, by way of explanation to Alexander and Beowulf. They stared at her with fascination, largely because of the decorations on her hat, which included a small stuffed bird. Not an ordinary poor person, mind you, but someone who has excelled at being destitute. At that, Cassiopeia's eyes rolled back in her head. After a few final death throws, she went limp. The stellar performance briefly distracted the boy's eyes from the bird, and they politely applauded. Oblivious, Lady Constance flounced around the tiny room. She put her frilly purse on the bedside table and examined herself in the mirror. You know, Miss Lumley, one occasionally hears talk about poor people, but all the conversation in the world does nothing to prepare one for the absolute shock of meeting them. I hope it was not unladylike for me to say so, but the paupers Baroness Hoover and I visited were filthy to the point of disgrace. Lady Constance turned and fanned herself. And their apartments, they were so tiny and depressing. Why they choose to live there is beyond me. It's puzzling, yes, Penelope murmured, keeping close watch on the boys, whose eyes were again fixed on the bouncing bird. Beowulf had begun to drool, which was never a good sign. I told them in the sternest possible terms that they must stop dithering away the hours in those dreadful factories they insist on going to every day and devote their time to worthier pursuits, like interior decorating. I'm no seamstress, of course, but honestly, how hard could it be to fashion a pretty tablecloth out of some lace? It would lend a touch of badly needed charm to all that squalor. Where on earth is the bell pull? I believe it's by the door, Lady Constance, Penelope replied, although she was unsure as she hadn't gotten into the habit of ringing for servants. Lady Constance searched and yanked vigorously on a cord, which turned out to be the tie back for the drapes. On her next try, however, she got it right, and the bell echoed anxiously through the house. She turned back to the mirror and poked at the poor little bird, which had fallen askew. Here is something else I learned about the poor, Miss Lumley. They do not even bother to dress for dinner. It's really quite appalling. Margaret! She screeched impatiently. Here I am, my lady. The pretty young housemaid finally appeared, with her high voice squeaky as a fiddle and her cheeks flushed from running up the stairs double time. I didn't expect you to be in the nursery, my lady. It's lovely that you've taken a maternal interest in the children, I must say. Margaret looked down in alarm. Cassiopeia was still frozen on the floor in plague position, like an actor at the end of a tragic play, after all the principal characters have killed one another, and the last surviving cast member must deliver a stirring monologue, summing up what it all means, while the fellow actors lie there covered with fake blood, trying not to giggle. Lady Constance stepped over Cassiopeia again. I wish you wouldn't dawdle, Margaret. I have been standing here for the better part of a minute. Now draw me a bath, please, and lay out a fresh gown. I have been in the most malodorous surroundings imaginable, and I feel the need to be thoroughly scrubbed. At once, my lady, Margaret curtsied and started to dash out to obey, but her kind heart got the better of her. Is the little girl all right, Miss Lumley? Penelope started to tell Margaret how the Athenians lost the Peloponnesian War, but Alexander beat her to the punch. Plague, the boy explained. Bubonic. Black death, Beowulf added. Cassiopeia opened one eye and coughed pathetically. Ah, ah, plague, oh! Margaret screamed, and a squeaky, piercing, blood-curdling scream it was. Lady Constance screamed as well. What? No, heavens, I scarcely survived creeping through the slums only to find my own house infected with plague. Eek! Eek! Don't panic, Penelope cried. She's only pretending. The boys yapped in agreement. In the melee, the little bird fell off Lady Constance's hat and disappeared somewhere in the nursery. Finally, Cassiopeia sat up and smiled, proving that she was not, in fact, dead from the plague, and everyone settled down a bit. Sorry, Miss Lumley, Margaret said, composing herself. Didn't mean to shriek like a banshee. I was startled, that's all. It was so lifelike. She's a talented lass, isn't she? Lady Constance, meanwhile, scowled. Pretending to die of plague? Have you ever heard of such a thing? These children are not quite right, Miss Lumley. Just because my husband has chosen to keep them does not mean they can behave like wild animals in my house. I understand, Lady Constance, Penelope began to explain. But the children have been quite swept up in the military history of ancient Greece, and one thing led to another. Gibberish, declared Lady Constance, whose own education had largely consisted of advanced studies in shopping, flirting, and hair care. Beg your pardon, Alexander said politely. Your bird. He tapped his brother on the shoulder. Beowulf meekly opened his mouth and extracted. <laughs> Esri, 
and extracted the bird. He held it out to Lady Constance. Soggy, sorry, he apologized. Lady Constance backed herself to the door in horror. This is precisely what I warned you about. Lord Frederick will hear about this. I must have a bath at once. Extra hot. After Lady Constance had gone, the stuffed bird was hung by the window to dry next to the stockings. Penelope decided that a math lesson was just the thing to restore some calm to the nursery. And as soon the incorrigibles were well on their way to mastering how to figure out the area of a triangle. Penelope left them a few practice problems to keep them occupied, and then went downstairs to find Miss Clark to ask her advice about how to spring someone from pr prison. But Miss Clark was out. Penelope was surprised to hear it, for Miss Clark ran the household with the iron hand of, well, a Spartan general, and that meant that she was nearly always on the premises. Moreover, none of the servants could say where she'd gone or when she might return. Back up the stairs, she trudged. Penelope didn't like to admit it, but her store of optimism was fast running out. She had already switched from plan A to plan B, but she wasn't one smidgen closer to rescuing Simon, locating the missing fortune teller, or cracking the mystery of the Hicksby's Guide. Now even plan C, in this particular case, C can be made out to stand for consulting Miss Clark, was not working out. Just like the wee mousy in the poem by Mr. Robert Burns, it seemed as if Penelope's best laid plans were being thwarted at every turn. Penelope could think of only one other person to turn to for help, her former headmistress, Miss Charlotte Mortimer. But given our brief conversation, I expect she will tell me to be a good governess and not worry. She, she thought unhappily. And what secret is she keeping about the Hicksby's Guide? If it's truly a secret, then she's unlikely to tell me, but I suppose I can still write a letter to her and ask. She did so, and dropped the letter in the tray to be picked up with the next post. With an hour yet before tea time, their lessons already completed, and Miss Clark nowhere to be found, there was nothing to do but take the children on an educational outing of some sort. But to where? They were still keen to see the theatrical haunts Simon had promised them. They felt that this way, even after Penelope had explained them that there were actually no ghosts involved. So Penelope led the incorrigibles on a walk through the theater district. The children oohed and awed as they strolled past the marquees and the colorful posters advertising the entertainments within. But the sight simply made Penelope fret all the more about the fate of her playwright friend. Perhaps he will find interesting ideas for a plot among the shady characters he meets in the lockup, she thought but it left her feeling even sadder that Simon was not with them. As they walked, she wondered which of the theaters was the one where Simon's stage manager acquaintance would have let them in to watch a rehearsal. If not for the stolen velocipede, perhaps they might have gotten a glimpse of the great Leotardo, master of the trapeze, or Pirates on Holiday, a seaworthy operetta, world premiere, or even the tragical tale of King Aethelred, the not-so-great, a most inglorious king he was each one sounded more thrilling than the last, particularly the one about pirates. Penelope's disappointment was excruciating. She considered purchasing tickets herself, but they were expensive, and although Penelope's salary was generous, Lady Constance rarely paid it until Penelope asked. After that unfortunate mix-up about the plague, Penelope knew that Lady Constance was much too cross with her and the children to approach. Then Cassiopeia begged to see the British Museum, but Penelope didn't want to take the children anywhere near it until she knew what, if anything, Simon had discovered about the Hicksby's Guide. What if Gallery 17 were a trap of some sort? So, instead, they visited the Royal Exhibition of Teratological Rarities, a small but fascinating collection of freakish ferns. There they saw ferns with leaves instead of fronds, ferns that loved the sun, ferns that lacked sporangia altogether, and other bizarre flukes of nature. It was quite educational, of course, but Penelope was still too worried about Simon to take any real pleasure in it. Given how Penelope felt, felt about ferns, this was a very bad sign indeed. Things were not looking up at all. In fact, they were looking decidedly glum. At least for Penelope, they were. But when the seesaw of good fortune sinks downward for one person, it is very often on its way up for someone else. This little-known law of physics is called the fulcrum of fortune, and although most people prefer to think of fortune as a wheel that spins, the fulcrum, that is, seesaw, is a more accurate depiction for most of us. Since the worse our own luck becomes, the more likely we are to notice the good fortune of those around us, 
and to think about the injustice of it all. In Penelope's case, the fulcrum of fortune was indisputably at work, for when she and the children were out, the post came, and came, and came again. Each delivery br brought a fresh torrent of mail to number 12 Muffinshire Lane, and despite the fact that Penelope was positively desperate to hear news of Simon or receive some sort of reply from Miss Mortimer, every single letter was addressed to Lady Constance Ashton. Lady Constance herself could scarcely believe it. She held the envelopes up to the light and turned each one over in her hands several times before she dared open it. But the shock soon wore off, and she began to await each postal delivery with glee. She even insisted that the stacks of mail be weighed on the kitchen scale so she could brag about how many pounds of letters she'd received. By the day's final post at eight o'clock, so much mail had come that Lady Constance sent for Penelope with the curt message that the services of an educated person are required to help open, sort, and reply to the heaping piles of correspondences. Penelope would have much preferred to stay in the nursery, building things out of toothpicks with the children until bedtime but she could hardly refuse Lady Constance. And she still hoped to speak to Miss Clark, so perhaps it would be just as well to spend the rest of the evening downstairs in the parlor. That way she would know the instant the housekeeper returned from wherever it was she had gone. And too, she thought, if I prove helpful regarding her mail, it might smooth things over between us. But truly, what an unexpected reversal. Why so many letters after so few? Indeed, the abrupt change in Lady Constance's postal fortunes was puzzling. But the answer to the puzzle had already arrived. By post, of course. This is curious, Lady Constance commented as she opened a long, official-looking envelope. It's from the postmaster, London General Post Office, London. I hope they are not demanding payment for the extra volume of mail. <laughs> Two golden eyebrows furrowed into one as Lady Constance digested the contents of the letter. After a moment, the paper slipped from her grasp. Miss Lumley! We are at number 12, Muffinshire Lane, she exclaimed in a tone of utter surprise. Penelope was well aware of their location, particularly after all those navigational studies with the children. But Lady Constance's news seemed to have the marking of yet another epiphany. I told my acquaintances that we were staying at number 12, Biscuitshire Lane, she went on amazed. So all the mail intended for me was held up at the post office, for as it happens, there is no Biscuitshire Lane in London. The postmaster himself has written to apologize for the delays. Lady Constance rose and fairly danced around the parlor. I knew it! My friends hadn't forgotten me after all. And how clever the post office is to realize I meant muffin, not biscuit. Such a display of competence is almost enough to make one not mind paying the post tax. Although you must never tell Frederick I said so. Overcome with joy, she tossed armfuls of mail into the air until the room was buried in a blizzard of paper thus undoing Penelope's efforts to keep everything in order. Look at all these invitations! Luncheons, dinners, weekends, drives through the park, games of croquet. How I love London! I am so glad I thought of coming here. And look, here's the very best invitation of all. She brandished another smaller envelope. It's a gift from Baroness Hoover. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Just a second. <coughs> oh my goodness, folks. Sorry about that. Apparently, <clears throat> Lady Constance's voice was making me chip. <clears throat> it's a gift from Baroness Hoover. An appreciation for all I've done for the poor and downtrodden. She paused to wipe away a pretend tear and then resumed her boasting. It says that Frederick and I are invited to the world premiere of a comic operetta called The Pirates on Holiday. Baroness Hoover says it has been sold out for weeks. And yet we are going. How clever she must be to get tickets. Of course, I'm not at all sure about pirates. It has a kind of criminal feel to it, frankly. But I suppose it will be entertaining in a popular sort of way. <laughs> pirates on holiday. Penelope's bitterness about the recent collapse of her own fortunes grew tenfold. Oh, the injustice of it all. And where, oh, where was Simon? <clears throat> 
Lady Constance returned to her seat and fixed Penelope with a bright, almost manic stare. Miss Lumley, since you are a resident scholar, allow me to ask you a question. What sort of jewelry does one wear to the theater? Are pearls too stuffy? Emeralds not right? If it were the symphony, the answer would be simply diamonds, diamonds, and more diamonds. Lady Constance looked at her expectantly. I, I cannot say, my lady, Penelope stammered. I know little about jewelry, for I do not own any. <coughs> Lady Constance scowled. Of course not. I simply thought that as a matter of cultural information, you might know what goes on in theaters. But I suppose they didn't have time to cover such topics in your Swanburne education. What with all your studies of plague and whatnot. Swanburne. Penelope knew the name was unlikely to stick in Lady Constance's mind. But she was feeling so gloomy, she simply couldn't stand it anymore. I attended the Swanburn Academy for poor, bright females. Swanburn, Swanburn, of course. Why is it so hard to remember? Obviously, Lady Constance could hardly expect Penelope to have an answer to this question. But she asked it nevertheless. Swanburn Academy, poor, bright females. Swanburn Academy, poor, bright females. Oh, my! She shrieked as if she had been pinched. Miss Lumley, does this mean that you, yourself, were once poor? Penelope squirmed and wondered if she were about to be fired. I suppose it does, she replied carefully. Or else they wouldn't have accepted me. Lady Constance rose and looked Penelope squarely in the eye. Miss Lumley, this is shocking news. Earlier I said many unpleasant things about the poor. At the time I had no idea you might have ever had anything to do with such people, or might even have been counted among them. Now I feel I ought to apologize. Then Lady Constance marched briskly out of the parlor, calling loudly for Margaret so that she might plan her outfit for the opening of Pirates on Holiday. Penelope was left to finish opening and sorting the mail herself. Feeling one ought to apologize is not quite the same thing as saying I'm sorry, she thought sadly as she poked her letter opener into the next envelope in the pile. But where Lady Constance Ashton is concerned, I suppose one could call it progress. This was the most optimistic thought she had had all day.